Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 353 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by former heavyweight world title challenger. He's talking to me from the gym right now, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? Doing good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. We're going to dive straight into the review part of the show, as we always do. Then our special guest this week will be Jackie Callum. And for people that don't know who that is, it's um, a bit of a kind of different guest to the kind of guest we would normally have on for an interview. It's usually a boxer. We don't really interview trainers. We don't really interview managers too much. We just tend to stick to the boxers. But I think it's a very interesting interview with Jackie Callum, who, of course, once upon a time uh, was a showbiz journalist who interviewed the likes of Elvis Presley and Frank Sinatra and all these other um, you know super famous celebrities and then she winds up um, interviewing um, a couple fighters at the Kronk gym she becomes a boxing publicist and then she becomes a boxing manager for uh, for for one of Eddie's favorite boxers of all time Mr. James Tony so that interview will be right in the middle of part one and part two so um, yeah it's going to be interesting and let me know what you guys think of it as well when you hear it it is interesting and um, let me know if you like it and we should get other guests like that in the future Um, not that I think there's many people quite like Jackie Callum who as well has had a movie made about her life as well so it is very very interesting but anyway without wasting any more time let's dive straight into the review part of the show we're going to start here at the historic stad hall in a place in germany um over here fear out ours land it seems like the perfect place to start it was last friday july 15th um fear out ours land with a second round tko win against juan rodolfo juarez who's now 20 and 7 but fear out ours land at 51 years of age is has racked up win number 52 he's got nine losses and three draws elsewhere on that card we should mention it it's a real weird one austin no doubt trout friend of the show a majority decision win over eight rounds against florin cardos who's now 21 and 4 austin trout 35 and 5 with a draw so one judge had it a draw the other two judges narrowly gave it to austin trout moving out now to um, the Copper Box Arena in Hackney Wick, London. I was actually at this card. We're going to run through the undercard real quick here. Um, Sean Noakes, that's the brother of Sam Noakes. He's now 2-0. and I think he had just the one fight, and it was a points win, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, he got in there with a guy called MJ Hall, who is a very, very, very tough journeyman who had a record of um, two wins, 84 losses, and two draws. Now, MJ Hall, of course, having that many losses, it means you don't get stopped often. He'd only been stopped five times in those 84 losses, so no one expected him to get knocked out by Sean Noakes, who didn't even knock out the guy that he boxed in his debut. Anyway, the unexpected happened. Um, Both of his opponents, to be honest, have been very durable, the two fighters that he's been in with, by the way, Sean Noakes. But yeah, it ended in the second round, and it absolutely destroyed my bets of the weekend so thank you there Sean Noakes um completely screwed me up (laughs) but a second round TKO for him it was super impressive very very impressive um and the same thing kind of happened with another um fighter on the card a guy called Khalid Ali he's now 3-0 again a second round stoppage against a very very uh, usually tough journeyman, Des Newton, who's now 8-25. and 25. Newton down heavy um, in that second round. I can't remember 
uh, what punch it was that put him down, but it was just, it was unbelievable. There was a moment where he had his back turned and Khalid Ali just absolutely swarmed him, really, swarmed him, was all over him. Then he kind of forced him into turning his back and then he was just, oh, it was horrible to watch, actually. Uh, that's that's how much he swarmed him. It was very, very impressive. Um that's it really for those two. Elsewhere on the card, a win on points for Sonny Liston Ali against Chris Attaway. A win on points for Umar Khan against Enkel Gomez. Um, Carol Italma with a win. He's now 8-0. A TKO in round four against Michael Gazdick, who's now 6-24 and with a draw. I thought that there's a chance that one could have gone the distance, so I got that one wrong. Um, elsewhere on the card, we had a win for Pierce O'Leary. He's now 10-0, and 0, a TKO win against Robin Zamora, who's now 17-15. and 15. Um, It was a punch that... It was a knockout that reminded me a lot of when Terry Harper got knocked out by Alicia Baumgardner, where she kind of got caught with a shot, and she was standing up tall, completely dazed um, on her feet, didn't know where she was, and that's what happened here to to uh, Robin Zamora, he was out on his feet, didn't know where he was, the guard dropped and he froze like a statue and of course any punch landed after that, didn't matter how heavy it was the guy was getting put down and it could have been extremely dangerous but the referee jumped in at the perfect time and didn't let him take another shot and he did actually fall over as well anyway, Um, so the referee waved it off, the guy fell over without taking another punch and then when he was down he got back up and tried to protest it no, not at all, perfect stoppage by the referee and I'm not sure who the referee was but brilliant stoppage um yeah great win there for Pierce O'Leary highlight reel type of stuff you don't see it often actually we saw it with Baumgardner and Terry Harper I remember Povetkin doing it to David Price but Povetkin did land another shot to put him down another big brutal left hook that David Price had no defense ready for um, anyway, moving up the card once again, Ryan Garner, now 12-0, and a points win against Christian Lopez, who's now 13-19 and with two draws, it went eight rounds. Um, Ryan Garner spoke to him super, super, super briefly after the fight. Um, you know, he looked good, but this guy, Lopez, was so hard to hit clean, and I could see Garner getting very frustrated. I mean, he won every round, but... You could see he was getting very frustrated. He was loading up on shots, and the guy was just taking him on arms and stuff like that. He was very hard to hit clean, and um, it was a good win for Ryan Garner. Brushes off the cobwebs, and he has a baby due, I think, in January. He's just announced, so January next year. So all in all, a really good uh, week or so for Ryan Garner. Moving up the card once again, Dennis McCann, very, very impressive. He's now 13 and 0. He becomes the first man to stop James Beach Jr., who's now 14 and 3. James Beach Jr. down once in the first round and once in the eighth round, which was the final round in the end because the corner threw the towel in. He was really, really impressive, Dennis McCann. I thought that as the fight would go on, he would maybe slow down a little bit and perhaps even James Beach could cause him some issues late on because James Beach had gone 10 rounds a couple of times. I think he'd gone 12 a couple of times. Dennis McCann hadn't really done the rounds and whenever he'd kind of got to about the fifth or sixth round in previous fights, he seemed to look a little bit tired. But apparently, from my inside sources, he had done the weight better than he'd ever done the weight. He didn't cut any corners and he looked really, really good. It's the best I've seen him. He was unbelievable and it's really exciting actually to see um, a performance like that. It was a statement, um, I think, and it sets up so many brilliant fights that can be made domestically there at featherweight if that's to be where he's going to be campaigning at. Um, Yeah, it was a bit of a weird one uh, because I think they did it at a catch weight of... 123 or 124 pounds, something like that, just above Super Bantam. Um, anyway, whatever. Um, elsewhere on the card, Nick Ball. Brilliant win for him. He's 16-0, and a TKO in the 12th and final round against Nathaniel Kakololo, who's now 14-4 and with a draw. Um, it was a really tough fight, actually, for Nick Ball. I'm not sure what the scorecards were, but um, he took some, some really big shots. There was one one round, I can't remember which one it was, but he took a, a really good shot, and it seemed like he was 
this is a bit of a stretch, but I felt like he was kind of on his way down, and then he got hit with another shot that kind of kept him up for a moment there. I don't know if he was actually going to go down, but he was certainly going in that direction, um, and he unleashed a, a hellacious beating over Kekolo as well, who took so many shots Um seem to show a brilliant chin you almost don't want to see him back over here testing another Brit because he can be a real handful um yeah I don't know if he's going to get the phone call to fight another guy coming through anytime soon in this country at least but no good win for Nick Ball he was given away about three foot in height he was absolutely tiny to the point where I wasn't even sure who it was in the ring because I had gone somewhere when they announced who was in the ring. And when I come back, I saw this really tall black guy and this really small white guy. And I was like, who is that? And then someone said it's Nick Ball. And I was like, wow, he's absolutely tiny, um, particularly uh, compared to that guy there. But no, good win for him in the end. And it was a good finish as well. Um, elsewhere on the card... Um, Hamza Shiraz with a win. He's now 16 and 0, a TKO in the fifth round against Francisco Torres, who's now 17 and 4 with a draw. Really good win for Hamza Shiraz, who has done something there. Um, you know, stopped Torres. And he's done something that in Torres' last fight didn't happen to him. He went the distance with Jose Benavidez, who of course is going to be boxing Danny Garcia in uh, a very short period of time so you know he's, he's got him out of there Hamza Shiraz and I think that was a really really good win and I think him moving out to the States has done him a lot of favors because he's in that gym in Van Nuys California with Ricky Funes the, the goose and gym and you know we see Brits go to America and train with an American trainer and sometimes you can kind of see that the British fighter is not the trainer's priority. And I'm going to use Amir Khan as a good example. He went over there to be um, in the Freddie Roach gym. And Freddie Roach had Manny Pacquiao. You know, Khan was kind of second best, if not third best, to some of the other fighters in that gym. But Khan was, is a self-made millionaire, a big, big superstar. But no, he wasn't a superstar in that gym. And then Khan went to, to um, Virgil Hunter. And of course, Andre Ward was the star, and Amir Khan was secondary to him. And, you know, I feel like a few English fighters over the years have gone out there, and um, a couple of them have actually trained with Freddie Roach and stuff, but they've never really been, like, the main guy. And at the minute, I think we've got Joshua Boazzi out there training with Virgil Hunter, but he's not going to be the main guy, even though I can't think who else Virgil Hunter has on his on his hands. But anyways, Hamza Shiraz goes out there, um, to this place, completely in the middle of nowhere, compared to where he's from, and he goes in the gym with Ricky Funes, and Ricky Funes in that gym, obviously working alongside Joe Goosen, has had the likes of uh, Brandon Rios in the gym, he's had the likes of Malik Scott in the gym, he's had the likes of um, John Molina Jr. in the gym, and many other really good fighters over the years, there's been some great fighters out of that gym, way more established at this period um, of of Hamza Shiraz's career, but already I've noticed that they're posting him on their social media, like Hamza Shiraz, Hamza Shiraz, they've even got a bag up in the gym with his logo on it, and I think that's a mark of respect to the British fighter, because it's not it's not been like that with some other Brits that's gone out there, and now I think he's also in the gym with Ryan Garcia as well, who of course is training under Joe Goose, and we're going to get to that a little bit later on, but I think it's a really good move for him. Um, that was quite long-winded, but that's just me giving my opinion. Uh, the final fight to mention on that card, Lennox Clark was TKO'd by Mark Hat. Uh, Mark Heffron, who really boxed the fight of his life, to be honest. It was for the British, the Commonwealth, and the IBF Intercontinental Super, super Middleweight titles. Um, Lennox Clark now 20-2 and two with a draw. Mark Heffron 28-2 and two with a draw. Um, it was the fifth round as well. I was... Re oh, sorry. Before I I've gone too fast there. I need to get back to... Um, Hamza Shiraz for a sec. In the third round, it was super exciting because Shiraz dropped um, dropped his opponent, whose name has eluded me for a sec, uh, Francisco Torres. He drops Torres, and then he goes on the front foot and tries to, you know, get on the attack and try to finish the guy off. And then he walked into a shot, and he goes down himself. And the whole crowd gasps, and then he, he gets back up. And I was very impressed, and I felt it was very important to see how... 
he would react to being dropped like that because he got a bit over eager, gets dropped, gets back up, regains composure almost instantaneously. Then he gets back to his smart boxing and drops the man again before the round was out. So three knockdowns in round three, um, two, uh, four Shiraz, one against him um, in between the two knockdowns. So you don't see that a lot. But I was very, very impressed with with Shiraz, to be honest with you, because, yeah, you know, he showed character there. And you don't um, you don't expect someone to get dropped and then come back and, and, like I say, regain composure that quickly to drop the guy again in the same round. Doesn't happen often. Very impressive. Um, you know, not perfect, of course, because he got dropped, but as perfect as it could have possibly gone after being dropped. Um, like I say, Mark Heffron fought the fight of his life. Um, Lennox Clark, I expected to win the fight, and he was the big favourite, so it was a big upset, really, for Mark Heffron. But Mark Heffron started really well, and he put a dent in Clark really early, and I thought that Clark had weathered the storm. He had a couple decent rounds, I think maybe like round three, round four, but then Mark Heffron kind of got a grip on him again and yeah I think if the fight went late it would have favoured Lennox Clark but he wasn't allowed really to get into a comfort zone as such because when he did have a couple rounds of just a, not much success but he had a couple of improved rounds that's when Mark Heffron decided to go well don't get too comfortable I'm going to come at you again and it was really impressive to see him stop him I thought at the time it was a tiny bit premature but it was on the blind side of me from where I was sat ringside so I'm not sure um, but yeah yeah, brilliant for Mark Heffron, over the moon for him. Moving out now to the Crypto.com Arena in Las, uh, Las Vegas, I was going to say, Los Angeles, California. Um, over here, a win for Lamont Roach, a points win over 12 rounds unanimously there against Ankel Rodriguez, who's now 20-2. and two. Like I say, Lamont Roach, 23-1 and one with a draw, looking to get another world title shot in the near future. Elsewhere, we had Ricardo Sandoval um, lose for the second time. He's now 20-2. and two. I believe it was a bit of an upset. He lost to David Jimenez, who's now 12-0. and 0. It was a majority decision over 12 rounds, and someone put a screenshot up of the, of the in-play betting, and for Jimenez to win the fight on points like with about 30 seconds to go in the 12th round it was like um you know it wasn't going to happen basically they thought that Sandoval was going to get the decision I don't remember watching it too tough to be honest with you but Jimenez was deducted a point in round seven for holding and uh, for holding and then Sandoval was down in round 11 so those that they kind of both cancelled themselves out both being 10-8 rounds the other way around but yeah Jimenez to win on points it was huge money in the final round, so they didn't expect that to happen, the bookies, but they were wrong. And the main event, uh, sorry, another couple fights to mention on the undercard, actually. Alexis Rocha now 20-1. and one. Again, last time out, he beat Blair Cobbs. This time, he got in with Argentina's Luis Alberto Veron, who's usually a really tough guy, and he showed his toughness once again. He lost unanimously over 10 rounds. Veron, he's now 19-5 and five with two draws. Rocha now 20-1, and one. Uh, Rocha. And elsewhere on the undercard, the return to the ring for Diego De La Hoya, the cousin of Oscar De La Hoya, now 23-1, and one, a KO in round four against Enrique Bernache, who's now 24-14. and 14. Um, Bernache cut from a headbutt in round one and stopped standing uh, a knockout win in round four. So good to see Diego De La Hoya back to winning ways. And then the main event, Ryan Garcia, now 23-0. and 0. I'd forgotten last week. I thought he'd had a year and a half out of the ring since he beat um, Luke Campbell, but he did fight a couple months ago against, um, oh man, the guy's name again has eluded me, oh god, it was his comeback fight, wasn't it, he boxed um, the African guy, Emmanuel Tago, I think his name was, back in, I think it was April? Um, and he went in the distance with Tago, who's a tough guy. But anyway, got in with Javier Fortuna. And on paper, arguably, it was going to be the toughest fight of his career. Fortuna down in round four, round five, and then in round six, counted out, knocked out. Um, brilliant performance from Ryan Garcia. Really, really, really good performance. Um, didn't really see a flaw in his game, to be honest with you. I think he seems to have improved off of the last time we saw him. Um, obviously, Joe Goosen working in the gym with him, so credit to uh, Denim Jacket Joe, 
Um, but yeah, what did you make of it, Eddie, if you saw any of it? Ryan Garcia to beat Javier Fortuna in that fashion. I mean, it just doesn't happen to Fortuna, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, this is the first time I've seen any kind of uh, uh, situation like that for Fortuna. And, and I mean, you know, Ryan Garcia, we know he's, he's, he's a really, really, really talented uh, fighter with a big punch, a lot of speed. You know, he's athletic and, and just has, you know, the sky's the limit for him. But there are things and are flaws I see with, with uh, Garcia. I think he stands a little too tall. Head up in the air a little bit too much. He's always, I think he's trying to, he tries to look over his punches, if that makes sense. He's like throwing punches. He also punches down and, you know, and his head is up in the air. And for me, calling out a guy like Tank is just not a good look for him at this point if he's going to perform. And I'm, and I know that sounds bad. And I'm, I'm and it's like, it looks like I'm nitpicking, but what I'm doing is I'm trying to match these two guys up. You understand what I'm saying? And when I match these two guys up and I look at what Tank does so well and I look at what Ryan Garcia does well. And don't get me wrong, Ryan Garcia has just as good a chance to land a big shot as anyone against even 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 Tank. But he's, him being that big target and throwing those shots from the outside like that with his head up and then punching down is just going to give Tank an opportunity to do, some, do something similar to what he did to Roland. And I think, and I don't think that Ryan Garcia is going to be as aggressive with a guy like Tank either, and which is which actually he shouldn't be, but I don't know. It's just it's just I I don't see, I don't it, it doesn't look like it would turn out good for Ryan, you know what I mean? Like I said, he's really talented, a really good fighter, and he proved that by beating Fortuna the way he did. But he's really just an overpowering force for a guy like Fortuna, and he proved it in this particular fight. Too fast, uh, too talented, and, and uh, you know, honestly, too, I guess, I don't want to say too big, but he was tall, he used his range perfectly, so I can't really complain. But him, with his head up in the air like that, and every once in a while, in that fight, even for the small amount of time that it went on, he was kind of like up in the air, and I and, and Fortuna with like an overhand left, or, or, like a, or like a hook, it was kind of like an overhand format. I mean, or a right, a overhand or kind of like a right hook. And it kind of caught him and kind of discombobulated his his uh, his planning for you know a hot second. And if he's in there with a guy like like I said with like a guy like Tank, it's just going to be a lot more difficult. And Tank, if Tank lands a clean shot, I just don't think it's going to end well for Ryan. Okay, well moving on to the next card. Uh, this one took place at the Stadium of Light, Sunderland, Tynham Ware, United Kingdom. This one over here, Thomas Patrick Ward with a win. Now 33-0 with a draw. I believe he has the longest undefeated streak in British boxing out of all the active fighters. However, the, the, the competition has been quite awful. He got in with a guy called Ali Morangi, who was a late addition to the card. Last minute opponent. He's now 12-3. and three. He was TKO'd in round three and it was a body shot and by the way Thomas Patrick Ward was cut as well in the second round it was an accidental head clash I mean I hope that the cut heals up quick but it's all he needs really uh, you know a cut just to keep him out of the ring for even longer I just do not understand this guy's career so so poorly managed uh, moving out now to the Chombury uh, which this this card by the way took place yesterday the Chombury Provincial Hall in Thailand. Over here we had uh, Famanu Niomtrong defending his WBA Super World Minimum Weight title, 23-0. He got him there with Chea von Moonsri, the former TBE, um, who is now unfortunately 55-3. and three. Lost unanimously over 12 rounds to the champion, so Neomtrong remains undefeated, now 24-0. and 0, Still the WBA Super World Minimum Weight Champion. But that is it though for the review part of the show. The final thing for me to do is to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former showbiz journalist turned sports journalist turned boxing publicist turned boxing manager and I'm sure many, many other roles. It is, of course, Miss Jackie Callan. Jackie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Joey. It's so great to be here. Say hi to all my UK friends. 
Absolutely, absolutely, and it's a pleasure to have you on. So, Jackie, first things first, I just named some of those professions there, I'm sure. Like I say, I left a few out, but tell me, for those that don't know, how did you ever get into journalism in the very beginning? Let's let's go there first. Well, journalism has always been my, my first love. I started as a child. I wasn't very good at sports, and I didn't have a singing voice. I couldn't dance. I wasn't really a talented kid, but I could write. So I started doing creative writing at about nine or 10 years old. And uh, I got published quite young, actually. And I decided that I wanted to go into journalism. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a novelist or an interviewer or a reporter of news, but I knew I wanted to write. I loved to put pen to paper. And I ended up being a journalist because I started interviewing people in high school for my school paper. And, oh my gosh, I found out that I was able to get people to open up and talk about almost anything. So that became my calling. I would do interviews with any celebrity that came in town, especially if they were willing to talk to a high school newspaper. You know, a lot of people were too big for that, but the ones that were willing are the ones I talked to. And, you know, Joey, before long, my reputation kind of preceded me. And by the time I was a senior in high school, uh, I was interviewing the Rolling Stones on their first American tour, 1964. And we just had such great rapport together. And they had a day off in between shows. So I said to Mick Jagger, how would you like to spend the day with me and my girlfriend? And so the Stones came to my house for dinner. I took them to a party. Uh, During the day, we went shopping. I let them drive my mother's car on the other side of the road, which they were dying to see what it felt like to drive a car on the American side. And so, you know, I, I found that I was really quite good at talking to people. And that's what launched me into journalism. (laughs) <laughs> it's an amazing story and I knew about that that Rolling Stones uh, story which is unbelievable of course it's surreal um, obviously Jackie in the 70s you know at this point you were interviewing Motown artists um, obviously most interviews back in those days of course were in person it was a, a lot more intimate uh, than most interviews these days um, and, 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 and because you have that intimacy in, in, in these interviews were there like I guess a, I guess a top five list of maybe artists you got along most with back from that era? Yes, I guess if I were to think about it, um, Frankie Valley, you know, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons were a really big group over here, and I got to know Frankie back in the early seventies, and we've stayed friends for over fifty years now. And wow. Paul Anka, another American singer that I've gotten friendly with, Paul Stanley from KISS. I've stayed friends with him. Andrew Dice Clay, who's a comedian over here. I don't know if you're aware of him over there, but Andrew Dice Clay is quite popular, and he and I have stayed very good friends. And uh, Sylvester Stallone, I've known him since 1980. We did a show together called The Contender in 2005, and we've remained good friends. And, you know, I've met such iconic people like Michael Jackson and Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, and so many athletes and so many movie stars, not to mention TV stars and recording artists, that the list is really quite long. But those are the ones that stand out to me as being the most memorable. Um, Quite a few others, you know, actors like Jack Nicholson or Warren Beatty or, you know, some of the Michael Caine and you know, some of the amazing people that I've met along the way stand out not only for their talent, but for their accessibility. They were humble and they were easy to talk to. And, you know, I think I've been blessed. If you have the gift of gab and you can talk to people as if you knew them already and there's no groupy attitude, no awe, just, hey, how's it going? And you sit down and you get into a conversation, they forget you're a reporter and you basically forget that they're a celebrity and it just it just becomes like a little get together you know sometimes they're in restaurants sometimes they're in dressing rooms sometimes they're on the road but no one ever heard of zoom back in the day so every interview was one on one and and in person and 
I, I mean, if you name a celeb that I've interviewed, I could probably give you some insight, but there's been hundreds of them. I'm kind of in the middle of doing two books now. One of them is a coffee table book with photos of me and all the different people that I've met over the years. And it's amazing to me how many in the last 50, 60 years I've actually met. Yeah, that's incredible. That is incredible. I'm sure you've got some amazing photos. Um, you touched on, obviously, a number of celebs there. And in particular, I must ask, um, obviously, Frank Sinatra, huge, uh, Elvis Presley, mega. And, and I feel so unprofessional saying this, but please tell me as much as you can about what it was like to be around Elvis. The question is almost exclusively for my sister, who was almost having a panic attack when I said I'd be interviewing someone that's met Elvis. So I have to absolutely ask this question. <laughs> well, you have to show her the photo of Elvis and I, because it's one of my favorites in my collection, because he was it was near the end of his life. I interviewed him and met him in 1975, New Year's Eve, and he died in 1977, August. So it was a year and a half before he passed. And he was very drugged up when I met him. You could tell that he was kind of out of it. His eyes were kind of half closed and a little glazed. And, and I just said to him, he was before his big concert he was doing at a stadium here. And I said, wouldn't you just love to just get out of here right now and go out to dinner and just hang out and not do the show tonight. And he said, Oh baby, you have no idea. He said, and that little drawl of his, he said, I would love nothing better. He said, but that ain't going to happen. And of course it didn't. And he went on and did the show and it was almost like he phoned in the performance. It was very um, typical of an Elvis performance, but um, very mechanical. He forgot the words to a couple songs and it was kind of sad in a way because if you'd known the Elvis of the 50s and 60s, and here we were, you know, in the mid-70s, he was basically just like a, a, a shadow of his old self. He was not the Elvis that we saw in Viva Las Vegas, and he wasn't that, that dynamic performer that we saw. But he was still so iconic that, honestly, when you walked in the room, the air felt different when he was there because he was bigger than life. He really was one of those people like Sinatra and like Michael Jackson and like Muhammad Ali. Those four people all, I think, had an aura to them that was almost palpable. You could feel the air was different when they walked in the room. Yeah, no, it's, it's unbelievable. And I love hearing about these iconic figures because, of course, um, I agree. I agree. I can imagine what it must have been like being around them in person. Um, in the late 70s was when you were sent to that legendary Cronk gym in your hometown of Detroit. Uh, this was, I guess, your first kind of step into sports journalism. What do you remember about your first trip to the Cronk and what happened for you to become attracted to the sport of boxing, which would, of course, follow this? Well, I started covering sports in 76 when they sent me to interview some of the baseball players in town and the football players, hockey players, basketball players, you know, some of the American athletes from Detroit. And there was, you know, quite a few. And I really enjoyed it because I came from a family of only having one brother, no sisters. My dad was one of three brothers. My husband at the time was one of four brothers. So I was around sports and guys and cars and gambling and all that for my whole life. So I was quite comfortable going in locker rooms and being around men. That didn't daunt me. But when I went to the Kronk Boxing Gym, the first thing that assaulted me was the um, the heat. They kept it 100 degrees in there so the guys could make weight easily. So it was really, really hot. And it was loud. You know, the speed bag, the heavy bag, the yelling, the rap music, just the whole atmosphere there was just really um, loud. And, of course, you could smell all the different, you know, smells in the gym, the Vaseline and all the different, you know, the gloves that were old and had that kind of musty smell. And, you know, it has a certain odor, sound, and and feel to a boxing gym, the really good, authentic ones. And um, I felt really comfortable right away, though. I think most women would have been put off by it, but I loved it. I loved the, the excitement. I loved watching the guys train. The only thing I didn't like was the cockroaches. I'd never seen a cockroach in my life until I went to the Kronk gym. And because of the heat, you know, and the moistness, 
you know, in the walls. Uh, there were a lot of them, and that freaked me out. But I got used to them after a while, and I just didn't pay any attention. I just zipped up my purse so they wouldn't get in. Because the first time I went there, they crawled in my purse, and I didn't know it until I got in the car. And I almost crashed when one of them crawled out on my lap. But that being said, you can get used to anything. And uh, I even became used to cockroaches. <laughs> oh, man. And I know that. Of I course don't like you, them. Yeah, you but don't I'm like them. them. <laughs> no, I don't like them. <laughs> Um, I know that, of course, when you went down the cronk, you you interview uh, Tommy Hearns. How did it go from interviewing him to subsequently becoming his publicist? And how quick was that transition also after first meeting Tommy? Well, the first time I met him, um, he was so quiet and soft-spoken. It was really almost hard to hear what he was saying. Um, I I had taped it, so I had to play it back on loud, loud, loud to even get what he said. He was very quiet. And very um, just humble and sweet. He was like 19 years old. He was just a kid, big gangly kid with long arms and long legs. And uh, gradually I started interviewing um, Emmanuel Stewart, some of the other fighters in the gym. And when he hired me about maybe three months into it um, to be their publicist, I said, well, this is going to be a new adventure for me. And it certainly was. And it took about six months for Tommy and I to really bond where he was comfortable. You know, I think that we came from very different backgrounds. And so he wasn't sure at first, you know, how to get along and relate to me. And, of course, now it's 44 years later, and he's one of my best friends in the world. I see him constantly. We live near each other. And so, you know, he's like part of my family. He comes to my family events. I go to his family events. And, you know, we're very very close. And at the beginning, I don't think I ever would have expected that four decades later, we would still be such a big part of one another's lives. But that's what boxing does. It forms relationships that last lifetimes. Um, All the fighters that I've worked with are still on my radar. We still stay in touch. And um, Tommy specifically, I mean, I was just with him Friday night. And that's the kind of relationship we have. And despite the fact that he's a seven-time Hall of Fame world champion, he's still a very humble guy. He dresses beautifully everywhere he goes. He's dressed to the tees. Wonderful to his fans. I mean, Joey, he's the kind of guy, if you met him, he'd put his arm around your shoulder and he'd get in a pose with you like he was going to punch you. And he's just a character. He's very warm and and he's just a lovely man. Nice, amazing. And I always say it to... I don't want to go off topic, but I always say it to anyone that speaks to me and says, you know, what are some of these boxers like? There's this, um, there's this, I guess, incorrect, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the judgment really on, on boxers, how they are. Yeah, People have a, people have a bad impression of fighters. They think that they're all going to be, you know, maniacs and bite your ear off and rip your head off. And some of them, I must say, um, do have angry temperaments. And some of them, like any other group of people, you're going to find the good, the bad, and the plain, and the exciting, and everything else. But as a rule, I've found that out of the ring, they're gentlemen, and, or gentle women in, in many cases. But in the ring, that's their job. They're at work, and they're in there to do a job, and they do their job. Then when they come out, they hug each other. They show respect in, in almost every case. You know, you'll see a few that have some actual rivalry that takes it out of the ring but in most cases fighters embrace afterwards there's good sportsmanship and there's mutual respect because it takes a lot to be a fighter a lot of a lot of training a lot of running a lot of sparring a lot of sacrificing what you eat the hours you keep um your sexual activity is based on when your next fight is so there's a lot of a lot of components and it's not easy. If it were, everybody would be a world champion. So I think fighters have a respect for each other because they know what it takes. And not everybody can get all the way to the top. Yeah, without a doubt. And you mentioned, obviously, the late, great Emmanuel Stewart. Um, he was running the gym, of course, at the time. I like to ask this question because I spoke to many people over the years that have you know, been trained by him or just knew him in any kind of personal capacity. 
everyone speaks so highly of this guy. Um, do you have fond memories with Emmanuel? Oh, my gosh. If it wasn't for Emmanuel Stewart, I wouldn't be in boxing because he gave me the opportunity. He opened the door to a white female from the suburbs who probably had very little in common with most of the fighters that came from the inner city that were from a, a much different background than mine. I was a mother with two little boys, uh, a suburban journalist who had, you know, very little that you would think would have in common with Emmanuel Stewart or any of the fighters. And he said, I don't care if she's female. I don't care if she's white. I don't care anything. If she can do the job, let's give her a chance. And I have always been so grateful and appreciative to him because had he not opened that door, I probably wouldn't have been able to walk into the boxing world. And, you know, not that it was easy back then being a woman in an all male dominated world, because there's always going to be the guys that are going to have a chip on their shoulder, aren't going to treat you the right way, or are going to have uh, different ideas in their mind of what you're doing there and why. And, you know, I can give you all kinds of stories, but overall, Emmanuel opened that door and he was very protective and all the guys at the Kronk gym looked out like I was a sister to them and they paved the way because when other fighters saw how well I got along with the Kronk fighters, they automatically gave me respect and that respect opened the door for me when I was ready to start managing, which was 10 years later in 88. But nevertheless, you know, I had by then proven myself, but that's a long time, 10 years of, of kind of a, an apprenticeship and under Emmanuel's wing. And then when it came time, he said, go ahead and fly on your own. Go out there, give it a shot. And if you have any questions or anything I can help you with, I'm here. And he was just the most amazing mentor to me. Never refused a phone call or request if I had one about how do I handle this? What should I do in this situation? He was always there. And he was wise. He was a wise man, and his advice was always right on. So I was blessed. I was blessed to have someone like that to welcome me to the sport. He taught me how to wrap hands, how to stop cuts, how to how to pick sparring partners based on the fighter that your fighter was going to be facing. He He just taught me so much about contracts and every aspect of the sport. So I feel like I had my college education at the Emmanuel Stewart Academy. <laughs> no, I, I love hearing stories about Emmanuel because he does sound like such an amazing human being and so selfless as well. Everyone speaks of how, uh, you know, how generous he was with everything. Um, obviously as well, you touched on there, Jackie, that you'd later go on to uh, take the, the transition from publicist to boxing manager. Um Yes, yeah, so you you stepped foot into boxing management. Your first fighter was Bobby Hitz. Um, am I right in saying you signed him right after, which is a strange time, I guess, to sign a fighter, right after they get stopped in one round? <laughs> That's correct. I did. And I just thought he was a, he was very charming. He had a lot of personality. He was like a real Italian stallion kind of kid, you know, kind of reminded me of the Rocky Balboa character. And I thought, you know what, maybe with the right training – you know, he could come back and do something with his career. And I thought, I'm going to give him a shot. He gave me a shot. And together, we formed a friendship that is still thriving today. He's a big promoter in Chicago and here in the States. And we talk almost, you know, every week. And he and I, like with Tommy and I, have just a beautiful friendship. And through him, that's how I got to James Tony because James saw us in the gym together and he saw how well we got along and how nicely dressed Bobby was. I got him the nicest little warm up outfits and I would be there when he trained and was really concerned. And I think that other fighters saw that a woman manager can be more compassionate, maybe, and more hands on than a male manager who's maybe just a businessman who's doing it for the money, but not really that involved with the fighters on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that attracted a lot of fighters to me because I was kind of a mother figure. I was there to nurture and, oh, come here, let me wipe that off you, you know, or let me get you some new shoes. Those are not good anymore. Or you need new sparring gloves. Those are getting kind of worn out. So I, I kind of had more of a hands-on approach. And I think a lot of fighters... Um, 
were happy to have someone manage them who also cared about them as a person. So Bobby opened that door for me, and uh, and a lot of fighters walked in after him. And as you said, James Tony, um, obviously James was such an excellent, excellent fighter, um, unique as well in his ways. Um, what was it like to, yeah, to be his manager? I know that you've you've said before in other interviews. You, I think your kids are the same age as him. Um, you said you were this mother figure. Um, but I'd imagine that James, just from the outside looking in, would be a little bit of a handful at times. Oh yeah, he was, and and that was part of the the learning curve for me, because I learned tolerance, I learned patience, I learned the mood swings that these athletes go through. And it's not just fighters. It could be football players. It could be rugby, you know, any kind of sport where you're really under a lot of pressure to exceed and to, to be great. That's a lot on your shoulders and they do get moody. And I learned how to deal with the different moods that fighters go through. And they're specifically more touchy near the closer to the fight the last few days, especially when they have to make weight. And it's right before the weigh-in, and they haven't eaten all week, and they're really getting, you know, they're hungry, they're they're angry, they're they're you know, they their mood swings are extreme. And I learned through James that that's part of the business. So now, no matter what fighter I've worked with since him, it's easy because I've already navigated those waters, and I know what it takes to deal with that kind of a psyche. And when somebody's getting ready for a fight they're going to be very moody. And so now it doesn't bother me a bit. I know how to gauge it and I know how to handle it. And James, like Emmanuel, taught me a whole lot in in other ways, in the day-to-day activities of a fighter and, you know, how to deal with those mood swings. And and James and I are good friends now. I had lunch with him a couple months ago when I was out in L.A. And I feel very close to all the guys that I've worked with and the women that I've worked with because there's a certain bond that you form when you're in that kind of a managerial position and you're working with them in the capacity where you can affect their career negatively or positively based on decisions that you make. So I've always tried to make the right decision so that the next day we can smile at each other and and not burn any bridges. And I'm proud to say that, you know, I'm still in touch with all the fighters that I've worked with. And Jackie, um, you know James Tony obviously better than most. And unfortunately, James is on that long list of fantastic fighters that just fought for too long in the end, much like Roy Jones Jr. But with James, it's clear to see uh, nowadays that obviously his speech has deteriorated quite badly. Does it upset you that he fought for so long? Or because you know him, do you have maybe a slightly different perspective to others? I feel bad for any fighter that fights a little past their prime because it does tend to affect them afterwards, whether it's their speech, their short-term memory, um, their sense of direction. Sometimes they get a little confused. And that bothers me because it could have been avoided maybe if they had stopped a little sooner. But you can't tell a person when it's time to hang them up because that's such a personal decision that someone makes with their own life. You can advise somebody, um, but you can't tell them what to do. And, you know, I respect everybody's right to do what they choose and what they feel is the correct move for them. But certainly when you look back and you see the damage that boxing has done to certain fighters, you know, you wish that they would have stopped a little sooner. You wish you could have influenced them. But at the end of the day, they're they're grown men and they're going to make their own choices. I wish Tommy had stopped a little sooner. Um, I wish all the guys that that have any kind of pugilistic dementia, slowed speech, um, short-term memory loss, I wish all of them had stopped before it got to that point. But the problem is you don't know when that last fight is that's going to cause the damage because it's cumulative. It isn't any one particular moment. It's all the hours of sparring. It's all the hours that you spend in the ring and at some point it does have an effect but you just don't know when that one moment is if you did if you could foresee it you could stop it but unfortunately there's no way to predict that 
Yeah, no, for sure. And another world champion that you managed, of course, in the past is a guy that I had on this podcast about a year ago, um, Bronco McCart. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking oh. with him about his career. What an absolute gentleman he is. What was it like to represent Bronco? He Bronco McCart is one of the finest people that I, I just saw him the other day as well. We see each other. I saw him twice last week, actually. These are guys that are such a big part of my life. Um, Bronco, I turned him pro in 92. He was coming out of the Nationals. He'd lost the National Golden Gloves. He didn't think anyone would want him after that. And I said, I'll take you because I believe that that's the amateurs. The pros are another animal. And if we match you right, you're going to be a world champion. And he lost his seventh fight to Clayton Williams, this guy, on the undercard when James fought Iran Barkley in Vegas. And I remember he was so discouraged, and I sent George Foreman in to see him, and I said, maybe you can just let him know that every fighter loses it at one point or another, unless you're Floyd Mayweather or unless you're Rocky Marciano or one of the very, very few that retire undefeated. But almost everybody suffers a loss somewhere along the line. And and Bronco just sucked it up, came back, and went on to become world champion. I'm so proud of him for the person he is. He's a big real estate tycoon here now, and he does you know really well. He has three wonderful kids. He's a grandfather now. Tommy's a grandfather now. James is a grandfather now. So I've been around these guys since they were teenagers, and now they're grandparents. So it's just such a, a wonderful evolution to be able to, to still be here to see their growth personally out of the ring, how, how they've managed to achieve so much with their lives. And, you know, it, it's for me, it's a testament to, you know, I think some of the, the things that might have instilled in them when they were kids that they've been able to retain. And I'm just so proud of each and every one that I worked with, you know, Pinkland Thomas, Boom Boom Johnson, all the champions that I've had a chance to travel the world with, Milt McCrory, Jimmy Paul, they were all spectacular in their own way. Um, to see them get that belt put around their waist after all that hard work and to see how they interacted with their fans and their families and their friends, the entourages that are there when you win, but that kind of disappear when you lose the whole psychology of boxing is fascinating to me because, you know, when you're a winner, your dressing room is filled with people. And when you lose, it's a lot quieter. Yeah. No, that's a sad thing about boxing, but it is, I think, the the best sport in the world. And yeah, Bronco McCart, what a what a brilliant, fantastic guy he is. Um, describe to me, Jackie, what it was like when you were managing some of these top fighters, because um, you were very much, of course, in charge of their journeys, both negative and positive at times. And I've spoken to many fighters myself over the years, and sometimes the fighter themselves come up with the craziest plan in their head about their career and I'm not knocking their belief in themselves I admire it but sometimes it can come across a little bit like borderline delusional as a manager to fighters who can sometimes have these crazy visions that are unrealistic at times do you have to kind of go along with it and try to believe in their vision yourself or do you just be honest with them even if they don't want to hear it sometimes that's really, really a good question. And I'll tell you why that's a good question, because it takes a lot of psychology to be a good manager, because I've had both examples. I've had fighters that thought they were ready for a, a title fight after 10 fights, and they would be very mad at me if I didn't match them with some top 10 fighter who I knew they weren't ready for. And they just thought, well, you don't believe in me. You don't have my back. And I need a manager who could see how great I am. And I would have to explain to them, I do see how great you are. But greatness takes time to develop. Greatness doesn't come overnight. And you are on your way to greatness. But if you rush it, you won't get there. And so let me do my job. I'll match you the best I can. Step by step, we'll get better each fight. But you can't go all the way to a top 10 fighter after your 10th fight. It's just not the right move. And it's a question of sitting down with them and trying to explain it. I've had it the other way around where I've had fighters that I know are extremely capable who could beat anybody at their particular stage of the game 
in their weight class and they're nervous to fight anybody. They get all, their stomachs get upset. They throw up the day of a fight. I can't fight this guy. I don't think I could beat him. He's too tall. He's a southpaw. He's, he's too this, he's too that. And so those guys need to be boosted up. You have to kind of convince them that they're better than they are. The other guys, you have to slow them down and make them realize that they're not quite as good as they think they are. So you get both examples with boxers, those that think they're better than they are and those that don't know how good they really are. So it takes a little bit of psychology and a little bit of patience to sit down with each individual fighter and tap into their own psyche and try to make them realize where they are in their career and make them believe that you've got their best interests at heart. You're not going to overmatch them and you're not going to feed them bums just to make them feel good that they're, you know, world beaters because that doesn't do anything for a fighter. So that's a great question that you asked because it is a very individual case by case thing. And, um, but you do see the ones that think they're better than they are more often than the ones that don't have confidence. Yeah, absolutely. You almost have to be like good cop and bad cop all in all in one almost. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. You're a hundred percent right. And I want to ask Jackie, what was your most frequent challenge when it came to dealing with fighters within a business capacity? I think the biggest challenge is keeping them happy, keeping them active when they say, When's my next fight? I gotta fight, I need to stay busy. And then getting them the right money because every fighter thinks they're worth top dollar. And some situations, there just isn't that money there in that particular fight. So you have to explain to them that there's basically three different reasons why I take a fight. One, the money may not be great, but it's wonderful exposure for you. It's a good win because this fighter is, is rated higher than you. And if you beat them, it's going to elevate you in the ratings. So even the money's not great. We're going to take it because it's going to enhance your career. Or maybe it's not the fight that's going to enhance your career, but it's really good money for an easy fight. So we're going to take it, even though it's not going to be a step up, it's going to give you a nice payday. Or sometimes it's just the exposure. It's on the undercard of a really big fight. Maybe it doesn't pay that much. Maybe the opponent isn't going to you know, put you up that much higher in the ranking, but you're going to get seen by so many people that never would have seen you otherwise. So we analyze every fight opportunity and try to explain to the fighter why this is the right fight at the right time. And that can be challenging because they may not see that. So I always have to explain to them, why am I taking this particular fight at this particular time? And once I explain it, they almost always understand. Yeah, no, that that makes a hell of a lot of sense to myself. Um, Jackie, what would you say was your most your most prominent skill when it came to dealing with fighters within a business capacity? I'm guessing patience must be right up there. <laughs> I, I would say that's probably one of the top qualities that I have is that I'm extremely patient. I'm very nurturing. Um, I'm a very even keeled person, which suits me well for this business because. I don't lose my temper very often. Um, I don't have real high highs and low lows. I'm almost always, I wake up in a good mood. I usually maintain that mood the whole day. And when a fighter loses, I don't get all upset and make him feel horrible for losing. And when he wins, I'm ecstatically happy, but I don't overdo it so that the other fighters feel bad if they didn't win. I think the fact that I'm very even keeled is, is a, an asset to me because they know that no matter what happens, I'm going to be steady Freddie. I'm going to be the same at all times and they can count on that. And again, the patient and I'm very tolerant. Um, I'm not a very um, argumentative person. I don't hold grudges, so I don't burn any bridges. If I have a problem with someone, we sit down, we work it out and we move on. I don't uh, stay angry. And that's helped a great deal because people have temperaments. And in this sport, there's moments when people get very upset. And if you let that bother you, you're going to carry that anger for the next fight and the next two fights. And then it makes a relationship dissolve and break down. So my thing is, if you've got a problem, let's talk about it. And then let's move forward. 
You know, we have one goal here to get you to a world title and I'm going to do everything I can do and you do everything you can do. And we're going to hopefully get there. And, you know, again, I treat them all like they're my family because they really are. When we work together, we're a family. And I have a kid now, Mike Kwan Williams. He's 17 and 0. He's fighting in August. And, you know, he's just getting to the point now where he's just a few fights away from a title shot. And when I got him, he was 18 years old. Now he's a father with a little boy. And you see them change and grow right in front of your eyes. And the pride I feel when I see how they mature as a fighter, as a man, it's so wonderful to me. You know, I, I just enjoy every second with my fighters. I have a kid here that just lost his first fight that he lost uh, last week. He was 3-0 and going into the fight with three knockouts. He faced a tall southpaw, and it was a little hard for him to get inside the southpaw stance, especially with the big difference in reach. And he lost the decision. It was sad. But like I told him, we'll be right back. Next fight, you'll make it up. Somewhere down the line, we'll fight him again and get that loss back. In the meantime, let's just keep moving. We don't look backwards. We look forwards. And it's important for me to let these fighters know that win or lose, I'm in their corner. And that kind of confidence makes a fighter want to fight for you. And they want to win for you. And at least they know that if they don't win every fight, that's okay, too. And Jackie, I'm going to, I guess it's kind of almost unfair to narrow it down to one moment, but I'm going to ask anyway. Is there like a single moment that you would describe as the, the most challenging one for you in boxing? Oh, gosh. I, I, I don't know if the word challenging applies, but I guess it would if you um, look at it as a challenge. But when James Tony fought Michael Nunn in Michael Nunn's hometown of Davenport, Iowa, in uh, 1991, we were a 20 to one underdog and nobody expected James Tony to win. He was a substitution for Stevie Collins. And so it wasn't really expected that he was going to win. I believed he could win, but, you know, going into the sixth, seventh round, he was behind and I started to get extremely nervous because I knew he needed a knockout to win. And, you know, I, I felt this was a huge opportunity. It could change both of our lives if he won, and yet it wasn't going our way. And then all of a sudden, seventh, eighth, ninth rounds, he started picking it up. He turned it around and knocked him out. And that was a very pivotal moment in my career, in James' career, and for women in boxing because it put me on the map as someone who knew what they were doing as opposed to, oh, she's okay for a woman then it was kind of like, she's okay. And so it kind of validated me being in boxing, I guess, because prior to that, I think people looked at me as a novelty or a gimmick, or they thought I was fronting for someone. Maybe my husband was really the the man behind the fighters. So that moment kind of turned the tables for me. So I feel like I already know the answer to this question, but had you been on the receiving end of sexist comments and stuff like that prior to this? I'm guessing so. Oh, of course. You know, um, I was 32 at the time. And so I was still, you know, I would say a good target. I was an attractive woman. And I think I was an anomaly in the sense that I was a white blonde in a sport that was predominantly, you know, Hispanic, African American. Um, it just, I was, I stood out. That's for sure. And you know, the promoters would make comments. You want your guy on my card? Well, what are you going to do for me? And the fighters would make comments. And you know, I just got so used to it. And I, I mostly dealt with it with humor. I would just say, "Oh, that's a great offer. Let me think about that one." Or, "Hey, if I decide to to go in that direction, I'll let you know." Or Wow, that's flattering. Thanks. I never acted offended. I never acted, you know, indignant like I was so insulted. I just kind of laughed it off like, oh, you boys, you know, aren't you cute? You know, and I, I really think that worked well for me because no one was ever offended and got mad at me or felt embarrassed that they had offended me in a way that now I'm going to look down on them. I just always kind of laughed it off like, oh, you got to be kidding. 
you know, or I'll say, oh, I'm so flattered. That's so sweet of you. You know, I, I kind of deferred every time to humor. And so I never really had a bad experience. You know, I had one promoter that, you know, would come to my door in the middle of the night and knock on the door, call my room and stuff. And, you know, he was a little bit more annoying than some of the others. But again, it was not a serious problem. It was nothing that I couldn't handle. And, you know, I had some reporters tell me early on that I should um, go put on a bikini and be a ring card girl and, you know, things like that. But I just laughed it off. I'm not the type to, I have a thick skin, so I'm not the type to take offense easily. And if they were thinking it was going to chase me out of the sport or make me cry or back down, they were, they were very wrong. Some of these things that were said to you, obviously, even me hearing it, it's, it's disgusting to hear now. And I'm, I'm uh, sorry that you had to go through these things. But in this day and age, a lot of those things couldn't slide now, obviously. when you Oh, you're back, right. I mean, there's, there's, can I tell you, Joey, there were so many worse things that I'm not you know, going to say because it's really not worth repeating and, and I don't want to use the language. But, you know, there were so many inferences that I was doing this with this guy and I was doing that with that guy. And, you know, um, things like I was called, a, you know, an N lover, if you can fill in the blanks and, you know, just racial comments, sexual comments, just re- stupid, ridiculous things. And I would just look at these people like, are you serious? You know, what century are you coming from? You know, I, I would try to make them feel stupid without, you know, really getting down and dirty at that to get to their level. I, I would never do that. But I would sometimes just roll my eyes like, you've got to be kidding. You know, how stupid. But a lot of the comments were just so raw. And, and nowadays, I think women with the Me Too movement would probably have reported some of this stuff. But to me, I thought, what good is it going to do? So they're going to get in trouble. They're going to be mad at me. To fight. I just kind of laughed it off and it worked well. But that was 40 years ago, 30 years ago. I don't know how a, a young girl would handle it today, to be honest with you. But it never became an issue for me because I never allowed it to become an issue. Um, but I don't know how a young girl starting in the business who doesn't have a thick skin, who whose feelings do get hurt, I don't know how she would handle it. It would probably be rather difficult. Yeah, for sure. And as you say, um, or as I said, you know, in this day and age, you you obviously couldn't get away with some of these things. And uh, you you said it yourself. You're very patient. You're very tolerant. Um, it's still obviously incredibly wrong for these people to have said these kind of things. But good on you, of course, to look back in an era where you know a, a female in boxing, especially. Uh, connected to some of these top fighters it just didn't happen and you were a trailblazer so to do it in these days I think would probably be easier actually if I if I dare say so uh, than the times that you did it so credit to you um, I want to ask you a really difficult question here actually Jackie I want to ask this it's almost a little bit unfair but if you could say what was your happiest single night in boxing do you have a happiest one above the others well again I would say that James Tony winning the title in Davenport was probably the best night. Um, the Barkley win was great. Um, a lot of the wins are great. Every win is a great win. But that one really made the difference in my career. Got us on the cover of Ring Magazine. Um, it, it, it did a lot. I'll tell you the interesting thing about it, and it's still a factor. Funny that you ask that, but um, that year when, when he beat Michael Nunn, the boxing writers had a big banquet and they named fighter of the year and manager of the year. And they gave him fighter of the year, but they did not give me manager of the year. They gave it to a, um, who did they give it to Aaron Pryor's manager at the time. And I know there was a lot of, you know, talk about, wow, if she wasn't a woman, she'd have got it. I mean, his fighter, he, he was the best of the year and she got him there. And so I just, very politely just said, well, maybe another time. I didn't complain about it. And then the following year, I got manager of the year. It was a a year late, but I got it. And now this year, James made it into the um, International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota here. And uh, I always thought when he got in, I'd get in, but it didn't work that way. He got in and I did not. So maybe at some point I will, maybe I won't. But it's just been interesting um, to see how 
the sport treats women and some things have changed a lot and some things haven't. But you know what? I wouldn't have changed a, a single thing. The night that James won was such a wonderful feeling for me as a woman to have a world champion when there were so many men that have tried for years and never had a champion. It, Like I said earlier, it did validate me, and uh, it will always be a highlight. And the opposite to a highlight, you, you, you said you don't have many low lows, or at least you don't dwell on them as such. But do you have like a big regret or any regrets at all? Um yeah, in, in boxing? I do, I do. Um, when my second three-year contract with James ran out after six years together, he was offered money and whatever else to go to another manager. And, you know, boxers get poached by other managers all the time. And uh, at that time, he maybe felt he needed a change, wanted the money, I don't really know. But he did go and sign with someone else and that was really a disappointment and very hurtful you know you get over those things you move on and sign other fighters but James was the best I've ever had and probably the best I ever will have who knows but that was a disappointing moment and I guess when when Tommy lost the first fight to Ray Leonard um, that was you know a a very sad night for me in 81 Um, I think we all expected that he was going to win from Detroit we were all Tommy Hearns fans Had it been a 12-round fight like they are today, he clearly would have won. But it was 15 rounds back in those days, and uh, Leonard came on those last few rounds and won. So, you know, those were both really hard-to-take events. And I guess when he lost to Hagler, that was another blow when Tommy lost to Marvin Hagler. It was a very exciting fight, but it ended the wrong way for for me. But um, the highs have been so much better more exciting than the lows and that's the way I look at my life in boxing is it's been so wonderful that the few lows that that that's life in general isn't it you get the highs and you get the lows you get the good days and you get the bad days so um overall I think my career has been stellar and I've I've just enjoyed it more than I could have ever hoped yeah, and talking of your career, obviously you've you've authored two books, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we've got uh, Hit Me With Your Best Shot and Between the Ropes. Not only that, but your life was the inspiration behind that 2004 film, Against the Ropes, uh, with Meg Ryan. Now, I know that a lot of that story was changed for whatever reason, and if you had it your oh way, you'd probably, you'd probably tear the script into a hundred pieces. But, um, I how would. Does it... <laughs> it wasn't really my story at all, Joey. They They completely... <laughs> put their own spin on it. So it really wasn't much of a movie that resembled my life. However, it was very inspirational to a lot of women. And I, and I'm glad for that. But uh, Peter Mann, who's an author from London has written a, an authorized biography of my life. That's coming out, I believe next month. And I'm not sure if it's going to come out um, in the UK and, and America at the same time or whether it's going to come out over there first, but it's called um, Against the Odds, the Jackie Callum story. And Peter Mann's just been a, a joy to work with. And so I'm really looking forward to that. And I do a lot of motivational speaking, which is, is just so much fun for me to go to a group of people. And I have a whole slide presentation with a lot of pictures and, you know, tell them just about my trajectory and, you know, my different careers and how one led into the other and show pictures of some of the iconic people I've met and some of my highlights and the the bigger moments of my boxing career. And, you know, it's so much fun to be able to share that with people. And I've got a TV show in development now with um, some really big producers over here and it's called Queen of the Ring. And it's uh, similar to The Contender, but it's for women fighters. So we're looking yeah. to find uh, the toughest woman out there. So that's going to hopefully start uh, – shooting this fall and you know and I I stay as busy as I can with all of my projects and you know my theory is you can get older but you don't have to get old and that's just not on my agenda you know aging is is you know a privilege that we don't all get so every year that I am here I I'm very appreciative and you know I have a lot of gratitude for my energy because let me tell you I get up and I'm on the run 
day and night, and thank God I do have a lot of energy. And, you know, I think that keeps you young. And you mentioned you're still managing a couple of fighters. Now you've got Michael and Williams. Um, how many fighters are you managing at the moment, Jackie? I have I have my clan and I have Sam Rizzo. That's the 130-pounder from Detroit. Talking to um, a kid from Africa that I'm hoping to bring over here um, in September. Um, he's a African champ. And, you know, I, I want to keep it low because I've got these other projects that I'm doing and I don't want to have a huge stable where I can't keep them all busy. And, you know, I think everything in moderation, and that's why my life is so flawless right now and is going so well, is I have enough fighters that I can handle that. I've got the books that I've worked on. I've got my motivational speaking. I've got the TV show that I'm working on. And, you know, when you have different projects and you have enough time to allot to each one, then you can be successful. But when you overload yourself, something's going to suffer. And I don't want any of these things to suffer. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty careful to keep that balance. And I think that's a lesson for all of us is don't bite off more than you can chew. And, you know, time management is so important. You know, finish every day what you plan so you don't put it off to the next day because then it never gets done. And so I, I think I'm pretty much on top of that, thank goodness. No, I'm really happy for you because a hell of a lot sounds like it's going on. Obviously, you said that um, Michael Williams, I think you said boxing in August. Um, you mentioned that the Against the Odds book, the, the Jackie Callan story, uh, is, is out soon. Any release date for that just yet, or you're not too sure, Jackie? I believe it's going to be in August. Oh, wow. August and, is a big one for you. <laughs> I, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a, a lot of fun for me. August yes. is going to be a fun month. And, you know... <laughs> The more, the more that I do, I've, I've been involved in a mentoring program with young women in the inner city for years. And we take these girls and we take them on different excursions to museums and we take them to beauty shops and get them makeovers and things like that. And it's so um, heartening to see that these girls just need a break. They just need somebody to kind of mentor them and give them encouragement And that's something that's very close to my heart because I believe every person needs somebody to encourage them. And if you're not getting that at home, then you need to be getting it somewhere, right? And then I have my, I have two sons and I have five grandchildren. I just got through co-producing a movie in Hollywood um, called The Legend of Jack and Diane, which is based on a John Mellencamp song. And that's being edited now. It should be out by the end of the year. And I'm going to be actually acting in a movie in August called One's Honesty. And it's a movie about teenage suicide. And I play a teacher who actually counsels these young kids in high school who are going through the tragic loss of one of their students from that, from suicide. So it's a big step up for me. I'm not really an actor and um, it's going to be a challenge to see if I can pull it off, but I'm excited to, to do it because it's a wonderful project. It's going to go out to all the school districts in the United States to help these students understand that they're not alone, that, that depression is a serious thing and drug use is a serious problem. And there are far too many suicides of young people. So I'm hoping this movie will will be helpful in that capacity and I can do my share to help young people cope with mental illness and that. So it's another little brick in my house that I can put in the overall package and when I look back on my life and to see an, another thing that I did that hopefully will have a positive impact. But, you know, you try as hard as you can to do as much good as you can while you're here And I'm 76 now, so, you know, it's not like I have 50, 60 years ahead of me. So I want to make the most of what time I do have left. You know, who knows if I could go to 95, 100, I'll take it, you know. But um, we never know, you know. And over here in America, you're probably aware of the fact that we have so many mass shootings at schools and at malls and at parades and in grocery stores. So it's pretty precarious over here right now. So... I think all of us are are appreciating every day, you know, in a different way than we used to. Wow. Yeah, I mean, 
you like I say, you had such a glorious career, obviously journalism and boxing, and to hear that at 76 you've got so many things going on just this year alone as well. So I just want to make sure I haven't missed anything. So let me get this right. So obviously you're managing a couple of fighters. One of the fighters is, is fighting in August. You've got the Against the Odds, the Jackie Callan storybook out soon this year. You'll be filming uh, the this this TV program like a almost like a female version of the contender in the fall. Uh, you're doing speaking. You're mentoring uh, young females. You're co-producing a movie coming out later this year, and also acting in a movie in August. Have I got everything right there? <laughs> yes, you're right. And and the 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 screenwriter and director of the Legend of Jack and Diane is doing another movie later this year. And I'm hoping to co-produce that one with him as well. I'm just going to try to figure out how and why to, you know, I can put that into my my schedule because I enjoyed working with him so much. His name is Bruce Bellacci, and he was a former fighter. And I met him through boxing years ago, and then he got into MMA. And uh, we actually promoted some MMA shows, you know, cage fighting together. And uh, and then when he got into screenwriting and wrote this movie, you know, he got a hold of me to to work on it with him. So he's just a, a very talented guy and I want to continue working with him. So I try to hand pick the projects that mean the most to me that I enjoy the most. And like I said, you know, it's time management. It's making sure that you make the time for all the things that you enjoy. And, you know, as long as I have the energy and the good health to do so. And I've been blessed because Joey, I've had my share of challenges. You know, I have four heart stents. I've had uh, 95% blockage um, four times and, and been really fortunate enough to catch it in time and have a stent put in, which, you know, solved the problem. And I have glaucoma, which is an eye disease, which I'm legally blind in my right eye, but it doesn't stop me because my left eye is great. And so I'm perfectly capable of doing anything that I did before and I have sleep apnea, which I just found out recently that I have. So um, I sleep with one of those CPAPs, you know, those machines. Yeah, but my dad it has doesn't sleep bother. apnea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just one of those things you deal with. You don't want to die in your sleep. And I do stop breathing, I guess, uh, 30 times an hour, they said. So wow. I have that now. And everything that I have is manageable. You know, I've had two bouts with malignant melanoma and uh, beat them both. They removed it. And although I have the scars to show it, um, it didn't get me. And so I'm still here. And so I feel that we all have challenges on our plate. And I just gobble up the challenges and swallow them and keep going. And I think attitude is such a big part of our success in life. If you have the right attitude, you can conquer the problems and you can be successful. If you don't have the right attitude, you can get pulled down by even the smallest setback. And to me, it could be the biggest setback, and I'm going to figure a way to deal with it because my zest for life and for succeeding is so strong that it kind of overpowers any of these little problems. So I guess I, the best I could tell people to do is just have a really winning attitude, look at everything positively, see the glass half full, and enjoy the world because you only get one trip around and you want it to be a good one. So that's what I try to tell people is just get up every day and make the best of that day. You have 24 hours, do as much as you can within those 24 hours to make the world a better place, make your world a better place, and just get the most enjoyment as you can. Oh, that is absolute, absolutely excellently put, Jackie. And yeah, you it's almost as if you've lived a hundred different lives in this one life. I mean, at 76 years of age as well, doing so much more than probably 99.9% .9 of people. It's unbelievable. We just need to get you in that boxing hall of fame. I'm not sure what's going on down there. There's a few well, people that listen, should be in. <laughs> if, it's, if it's meant to be, Joey, it will happen. And in the meantime... Everybody has a bucket list of things they want to do, and one of mine is to come to England. Uh, my grandparents are from England, and it's something I've always wanted. So I'm hoping that when the book comes out, maybe I'll get to come over there for a book tour because that is one thing that um, I definitely want to do, and that is to go over there and, and to, to actually see where my grandparents were born. And and so that's that's on my list. So if so, 
I will certainly look you up and we'll go have some tea or something. <laughs> we certainly will. And just before we wrap it up, Jackie, um, if you've got any closing words, um, I was going to say like any words of wisdom, just I guess in in life in general, perhaps that you want to uh, share with us just before you go. But you have shared so many um, excellent pieces of life advice during this interview if you have any others though please let them out before we let you go (laughs) well I, i just think i live by the motto that i'm too blessed to be stressed and the best attitude is gratitude and to just see the best in every situation and that's how i live and it served me well and i try to tell other people that don't sweat the small stuff because it's basically all small stuff and save worrying for the big things Don't worry about something that might happen because every second you worry about it, you're taking away time that you could be productive. And if it's going to happen, you can worry about it then. And in the meantime, just enjoy the day. So that would be my my biggest advice to people is live for the moment. Oh, that's brilliantly well put once again, Jackie. It's been unbelievable speaking with you. Listen, it's been an absolute delight on my end. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and your stories. It's well, been a thank blast. thank you. I've I wish enjoyed, you the best you of luck. wonderful questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Joey. I appreciated talking to you. Honestly, honestly, I wish you the best of luck with everything. I wish you good health, and I hope that we can speak again someday soon. Anytime, just let me know. Thank you so much. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. One fight that's been announced here for August 27th. It's a top-ranked show. We're going to see Jose Pedraza getting in there with Richard Comey. I think that's an excellent, excellent fight there between two former world champions. And also on the card, we get to see heavyweight Jared Anderson, the real big baby, getting in with Milyan Rovkanin. That one, again, is going to be August 27th at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Tulsa. So, um, yeah, I really, really like both fights there, to be honest with you. Um, particularly the Pedraza and Comi fight. Obviously, Comi friend of the show. Best of luck to him. Uh, tickets start at $49 as well. Uh, anyway, that is it for that one. The The other piece of news, it's the final piece of news that I have, is that Diego Pacheco has extended his promotional deal with Matram Boxing and yeah he'll be fighting for a title on the Canelo Triple G 3 undercard Um, I'm not sure what title it is oh yeah it's the WBC USNBC Silver super middleweight title whatever that is all the best to young Diego Pacheco moving on now to the preview part of the show only two cards to go over we're going to start here with this one it takes place on Saturday July 23rd at the Grand Casino in Hinkley Minnesota USA it's going to be live on ESPN plus on the undercard we have heavyweight the Italian heavyweight Guido Vianello 8-0 with a draw gets in with Rafael Rios who's 11-3 um it's not a fantastic undercard, really. We've got Gabriel Flores, uh, Gabriel Flores Jr., twenty-one and one in a ten-rounder against Giovanni Cabrera, who's twenty and zero. And then the main event, former world title challenger Joet Gonzalez, twenty-five and two. I don't think. Well, I know that he 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 had a sister that was in a relationship with Shakur Stevenson, and those guys both fought. And of course, Shakur won that fight. And then Shakur, uh, I think parted ways with his sister and now Shakur has a child with a new woman all the best to Shakur he's loved on this show but anyway uh, Joet Gonzalez back to it 25 and 2 getting in with former world champion friend of the show Neho Mr. Isaac Dogbay, 23-2. and two. It's for the WBO International Featherweight title. It's over 10 rounds. It's a really tough fight for Isaac Dogbay, who just has not looked the same fighter up at featherweight. He certainly was way better suited to 122, and he has not looked as good at all uh, at 126. It's not even close. And I think this is a really, really, really hard fight for him, to be honest with you. So, um if I'm not mistaken, I think Joet Gonzalez got in there with Navarrete, the man to inflict both losses on Isaac Dogbay's uh, resume, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that happened. But I'm not sure. Off the top of my head, I think both guys lost. Uh, well, both guys lost in the end to Navarrete. But of course, Dogbay got beat down by Navarrete. It doesn't necessarily mean much. 
But um, yeah, it's going to be a decent fight, I guess. I just hope Dog Bay can win because it's a really tough one. Um, and moving out now, it's the final card to mention. It takes place at the Embassy Suites in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, USA. It is a card promoted by a bunch of different guys. Greg Cohen, uh, Dimitri Salita, blah, 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 a few other guys. Anyway, the, the main fight to mention, would you believe it? The return of Big Baby Miller. In the US, Jarrell Big Baby Miller, friend of the show, 24 and 0 with a draw. The Brooklyn heavyweight gets in with Derek Cardenas, who's 8 and 9. This is following Jarrell Miller fighting, um, what was it, the, the other week or whatever, when he weighed in at 330 something pounds, which was equivalent to three Nonito Donez. Um, anyway, all the best to Jarrell Big Baby Miller. Um, yeah, obviously we say no to drugs and stuff like that, we say no to peds, but, um, yeah, I don't think that's the case anymore, I think he's obviously served his ban, which was certainly a few years, and it's going to be good if he's clean to get him back in the division, because he was a really tough guy, and he brought some weird dynamic to the heavyweight division, because he was tough, he had a decent engine, perhaps that's why, but we will see what he looks like without... Uh, without anything in his system that shouldn't be there. All the best to him. But that is it, though, for the show, pretty much. Um, in part one, we did the review part. We welcomed our special guest, Jackie Callan. In part two, I just did the news, and I just wrapped up the preview part just there. The final thing for me to do, just before we wrap up the show entirely, is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 353 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to our special guest, Jackie Callan. It was an honor to speak with her. She's a woman who truly is an inspiration to anyone, to be completely honest. But let me know what you think about us having a different type of guest to usual. Should we do it again with somebody else? Let us know. We appreciate the feedback. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe and we shall see you all again next week.